Welcome ESG Talk listeners. Man, do we have a treat for you. Today, we're joined by what I call my text or phone a friend on any regulatory issue, Steve Soder, who is an SEC expert and works here at Workiva with different groups across the U.S., uh, particularly our ESG pro groups, which you heard a little bit about in our season of gratitude as well as Andy Wood, who is across the pond in our EU and UK region. And she looks at all different regulatory requirements uh, as it relates to our products and services for our customers. So when we talk about ESG regulation around the globe, these are two that I bring in. And I was trying to look up some famous trios because we all have like a very deep sense of humor And Steve, I'm not like as cool as you that I could come up with like a cool meme for the three of us. But I found that I was like, maybe Harry Potter is a good reference. You know, Ron, Harry, Hermione, like that could be a good reference for us. But then I was like, we're all more like Ravenclaw, which is we're really intellectually stimulated by research and geeky regulation. So I don't know if either of you have better trios than me. <laughs> That's what I came up with to describe us. I don't know. I call Hermione. That's all I'm saying. She's a smart one. <laughs> Actually, I could see that. You would get us out of trouble as the SEC guy. <laughs> I, I kind of feel that. What do you think, Andy? I think I might get us into trouble. So this probably works as an assignment. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Ravenclaw, raise your mind a little bit. Use that intellect. We should. We should be pretty good. Well, As we think about all the action and activity for for regulation in 2022, and Steve, why don't you go first? What's one word you would use to describe 2022 regulation? Uh, You know, intensity, I think. I mean, we've seen an incredible amount of proposed and adopted rulemaking, uh, certainly proposed on the U.S. side, uh, you know, some big adoptions. I won't steal Andy's thunder uh, on the EU side, but I would say intensity. There has just been so much going on, so much to pay attention to during the last year. I, uh, I'm hoping we can all catch our breath just a little bit uh, as we uh, get ready for year end and see what's to come in 2023. Let's pivot to the troublemaker. Andy, what, do you, what would be the one word you would describe 2022? Not too different to Steve's take. I think I was going to say bumpy. Uh, in the obviously we've we've had great expectations for this year, and I think um, we've known very much. We had timelines and we had expected dates for various things to happen. But even and there's been a lot of really really interesting progress. But I think even so, companies haven't been feeling like it's been a smooth journey. Um, so I, I think that that kind of road is is evolving, and I think it's all going in the right directions. But I think many would argue that it's been quite a bumpy road to get there. Because you are the geniuses you are, you get two questions right off the bat. So then what one word would you use to describe 2023? And let's start with you, Andy. So I'm kind of excited for 2023. I don't know if that'll that'll translate for how all our customers feel about it. Um, but kind of having got to the point where we've got some certainty now, um, not everything, which we'll, I'm sure we'll cover later, but we've kind of got that ground level of feeling like, this thing is happening now. There's a certain amount of regulation that's that's got itself a little bit of a stable platform. Um, and I think that makes the change to come and the work to get down to it really, really exciting. As there's some actual changes we can make. There's some things we know we can do and we can actually go out there and start to get on with it. What's your take, Steve? Um, so I said intensity for 2022. For 2023, suspensity? Is that a word? I don't know. Maybe it's just suspense. <laughs> Um, you know, I think we've got clarity, as Andy mentioned, certainly on the EU side. But, but you know, here in the U.S., I think we're all waiting for the SEC's climate proposal to see what's going to happen. Uh, we're, of course, going to get into that in the discussion. But, you know, the other thing that's on their agenda is a human capital proposal. I fully expect that any day now. But, you know, as we close out uh, uh, here at the year end, it, 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 it might not happen until Q1 uh, of next year, which would be fine. But I do think there's some some suspense there, at least as far as what's going to happen with the SEC. We recently had an election. Uh, you know, I think that's got some people kind of wondering. So as I look at 2023 on this side, I certainly think there's some suspense in the air. All of us waiting to see how this plays out in the months ahead. I would agree with both of you, especially on the first sentiment of, of the word for 2022. Maybe where I would take a little bit of a twist is 2023. My word for the year for for a lot of individuals and myself is alpha. Yeah, ESG has to produce alpha for your companies. And whether you're thinking about how reporting produces alpha with regulatory and risk, or you're thinking about the return on investment, like we talked about in a previous episode with Tanzi Whalen, I think that's going to be key. And, and to your point, Andy, building on that, it's going to create 
2023 is going to create focus, especially as we look at what the, the market is doing financially. You don't have time not to focus. And so I think uh, alpha is the word I, I would kind of leave our listeners with heading into 2023. So, Steve, we just had you, and it's such a privilege, and this is why I love bringing the two of you in for our audience and our listeners, is I actually bring Steve and Andy into our executive team meetings. And Steve was with us, 40 leaders across the company as we were working on our ESG strategy uh, this past month, and he gave us a landscape view of what's going on with the SEC and what do companies need to pay attention to. So, Steve, what a year. Uh, How do you see this playing out next year? Um, well, I think there's a lot, certainly a lot to pay attention to. I will, I, I will remind your listeners here that, uh, the excitement and the enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm in the room got decidedly like, you know, I start talking about <laughs> SEC rules and, uh, you know, you could, you could see the energy kind of went out the door just a little bit. Uh, so hopefully we don't do that for this podcast here <laughs> with their audience. Never, never. Um, no, I, th- I think there's some interesting things going on. I, I think some things to pay attention to is actually, the G, you know, we're going to talk about um, the E and the SEC proposed climate rule in just a second. But um, I think the G is actually really important. You look at a recently adopted proposal uh, by the SEC on a compensation clawback. Uh, so to me, that 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 really speaks to governance. If you look at the SEC proposal on cybersecurity and risk management, the type of disclosures and the policies and processes that are going to need to go into that, to me, that speaks really strongly to the G. And, and I actually think that we're going to see more of that just with uh, some of the notable kind of fallouts and, you know, company dramas, I think, that have happened, you know, recently that have kind of made the headlines. Those, to me, are actually very core governance issues. And I think for a long time, the U.S. has maybe taken for granted that governance is good. We've got, you know, fulsome disclosures and proxy statements, and that translates into 10Ks in other areas. But I actually feel like there's going to be a bit of a renewed focus the other thing that I bring up just that I expect, again, is is the human capital disclosures. You know, the SEC proposed and adopted guidance for, I'd say, fairly generic and qualitative disclosures over uh, uh, in, in 10Ks. But now that's going to be, you know, moved to more prescriptive kind of quantitative. Hey, these are the, the, the bits of information that you need to provide, which I think is going to, you know, create this whole other conversation um, around, again, what's the meaning and what's the value and, and where does that play into disclosure? But is I just look at the way this information is being used and consumed, it, to, to me, it'd be hard to see why you couldn't make a very strong argument that investors actually value that information a ton as companies go from being more human capital intensive as opposed to, you know, assets and those types of things. As far as the proposed climate disclosure rule, again, I suspect we're going to see something adopted. And I would think about Q2-ish, you know, I, I think a lot of us were really anxious to see something happening very quickly. Um, but Chair Gensler himself actually said, hey, proposed rule making is 12 to 18 months. Uh, he said that before a, a Senate testimony, and that actually, I think, is very generous. So even if you take him at his own word, that by definition puts us, you know, again, somewhere mid-2023, and, and, and that's what I would expect. I really value that perspective, and Andy, I'm going to move it over to you as we ping pong back and forth among among the three of us. What we saw out of the EU November 10th was a little bit more certainty. And so there was the EU parliament vote overwhelmingly passing the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive known as the CSRD, the major ESG regulation that is in play in your region. Is this the end of regulatory uncertainty or in the EU? And, you know, what's your thoughts there? Well, I think there's at least one thing that we can be certain on, and that is that ESG acronyms are not going away. Um, (laughs) We've already heard CSRD there, um, and I'm about to get to ESRS shortly. So um, we can be certain on that much. I think more seriously, though, I don't think um, this is the end of all uncertainty. But what I think it is, is a really solid base for companies to move forward from. Um, So the directive itself has quite a lot of detail in it. Um, It's actually one of those... um, fantastic super directives that actually amends a whole load of other different directives around the place um, and incorporates a lot of useful information. Um, But it's given us some really good solid timelines. It's given us certainty about who's in scope to some extent. There might be a little bit of a discussion about that as well. Um, And it's given us a very, very clear idea of exactly what the expectations are more broadly. We know there's going to be standards. We know we're looking at, you know, assurance and it's going to phase limited assurance, reasonable assurance will be considered again in future. 
Um, and we know that finance and ESG are going to have to be increasingly working pretty closely together. Um, but I think what we still see is that there's still obviously this is a really, really big piece of work. Um, and with that need for there to be European sustainability reporting standards, that's the ESRS, um, we know that, that they have to be developed. Um, those things did not exist before the regulation proposed that they should exist. Um, so, so that's where there's still some level of uncertainty is in the development of those standards. Now, we've just had um, a few days ago, the, the so there's a slightly complicated process where the standards have to go over to be written into law. Um, and that part of the process has just happened. So we've got now this set of 12 standards. Um, they're a little bit scaled back from some initial drafts. I think there's a lot of feedback on exactly where the depth needed to be. And some things have been shuffled off into the next phase of those standards, which is, again, where we still got a bit of uncertainty, which is when they start to produce and look at um, sector specific standards. So we've got general first, then sector specific. Um, and that leaves us with still a little bit of information to find out if, if, for example, a company is in or active in one of those what are considered to be higher risk sectors. Um, so, you know, obviously extractive industries, um, certain indus um, industrial processes, that kind of thing. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. But I do feel like we're in a much, much better place uh, than we were sort of just before we got that, that really overwhelming parliamentary vote. Steve, I want to hear your take on on that piece, because there is a level of uncertainty. But Andy made this comment about there will still be a lot of acronyms and a lot of other pieces that come into play. Can you talk a little bit around what's happening outside the SEC that is also going to add to the ESG management pieces that will make it a little bit more complicated? Sure. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the things actually that, that, that came out of COP27 uh, is the you know White House announcing that major federal suppliers are going to be required to disclose uh, environmental impacts through CDP. You know, scope one and two is certainly, uh, you know, very high on that list as well as other things. And I think I think as you start and I use that as example is is the same bits of information that are now being requested from not just investors or customers or others, but I mean, again, some form of regulation outside of the SEC. And so you start to see this kind of notion of, of convergence. Now, let me be careful. If you're accounting and you've been looking at, uh, um, if you're an accountant and you've been looking at converging you know, accounting standards with the U.S. as well as what's, you know, done internationally. That's something that we've been waiting for for a long time and might never fully get there. So I want to be careful when I talk about that just for some some context. But I do think that the more that these um, that these flows of information start to kind of get created, um, you, you start to develop this kind of core of, hey, you know what, these are things that we have to be paying attention to. This is data that we have to be capturing, again, regardless of whatever the SEC does. And so I think, Mandy, from that standpoint, some notion of convergence and some kind of basic set of, 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 of ESG related data, particularly on climate right now, um, I, to me, that seems kind of inevitable. And so I think as, as companies are kind of thinking through, OK, where do I prioritize starting to think about, OK, well, how would I capture that data and where am I going to store it and how am I going to report on that and who needs to be involved and what, you know, controls and other you know risk mitigating processes do I need to have in place? Those, to me, I think, are the kind of conversations that I would expect companies to be having, uh, certainly right now, and if they're not, very quickly getting into the new year. Because, again, I do think that, that some form of kind of convergence of some basic data sets, uh, to me, feels inevitable. I was just going to add, if I can, that there's an interoperability point that's been very key to the discussions around the European sustainability reporting standards, which is, of course, that there's also international sustainability standards. And I just wanted to highlight Steve's comment about climate, because climate is one of the areas where they've really been actively working on that interoperability. Um, and we're talking about that a lot during COP27 and uh, formal mappings. And I think that's that's an area where there's significant progress being made. Um, which I think should at least reassure companies a little that this isn't always going to be a wholly divergent landscape. So as Steve was in front of our executive team last month. One of the things we talked about is our own business as a global public company operating in all regions of the world. Uh, what is the impact of the CSRD? And many of our listeners are going to be trying to figure this out as they are maybe a non-EU company or are an EU company that operates in the UK or operates in Singapore. So Andy, can you tell us what, what you think this is going to look like in practice for companies like ourselves and others trying to tackle CSRDs and some of the European regulation? 
Yeah, I think there's there's kind of multiple layers to how it's going to impact companies that are not um, directly present in the EU. I mean, the, the first and the easiest answer is for the companies that are directly listed in the EU. That gives them that presence on the regulated markets. Um so that, you know, that that makes it fair. they have that listed presence there. But then I think there's other things that have grabbed a great deal of attention. I mean, I think the first one is obviously that the EU wanted to make sure that the data was available for all the entities present in the EU above a certain size that are not necessarily headquartered within the EU, but have that significant revenue impact in the markets. So they they set a requirement that um, if with, even without the headquarters, if the subsidiaries or branches and a uh, corporation has above that 150 million revenue mark of operations within the EU, then those subsidiaries and branches are going to have the responsibility to, to start that reporting. Although there's a bit of a time lag there, I think. So it's not necessarily something to worry about immediately from a regulatory perspective. But that brings me, I think, quite nicely onto the third layer of impact, which is very much that, um, and we're especially seeing that in countries which have that still that very close tie to the EU, like the UK, um, that compliance or reporting against those standards isn't necessarily just about a regulatory perspective. There's a lot of data there that stakeholders are going to want to be able to compare with EU peers and EU counterparts for companies. Um, and of course, all those EU companies will be publishing a lot of information across those 12 standards, which is across all three pillars of E and S and G. Um, and it's going to be a demand, I think, for, for certain aspects of that from investors and from um, stakeholders that companies are at least able to provide something related or comparable, um, sort of regardless of whether or not they're really falling under that compliance umbrella directly. So as we close out and we and we get really practical for, for our listeners, what is the biggest challenge in one to two sentences that you think they need to grab hold of in 2023? Steve, what, what's your reaction to that? I realize this is going to be a little bit um, repetitive if you've been on any kind of webinar recently, especially involving a technology company, but aligning the right people, processes, and technology, those three things could not be more true than they are with ESG. And I think getting, uh, again, the group of stakeholders together with inside the company, not too different, Mandy, from what you know we were doing actually at Workiva not too long ago, and actually going through those lists and determination uh, and, and determining exactly, okay, what do we have available to us today? Where do we need to get in the future? And how do we, again, align all of the priorities and risk mitigating processes and everything else in order to get there? That to me is so paramount for companies to be doing right now. And maybe that was six sentences, not two. <laughs> all good. All good. Teacher, tech, and talent. And I understand it's not numbers, it's words. So you might fudge a little bit there. <laughs> That's okay. No, thank you. All right. Andy, what do you think? What's what, in one to two sentences should people grab hold of for regulation in 2023? I think it, for me, it's um, heading back towards one of those uh, core requirements from the CSRD, and that's assurance. Um, obviously, uh, pretty much everything that Steve said applies to this situation, but I think it's more of an emphasis on looking at the ESG data and how that is collected, how it is reported. And the um, directives and the aims in the EU are very much to bring the standard of that ESG data up to the standard of the financial data, which I'm sure is also a global objective. But it means that companies really need to take a look at and learn from their finance teams and also really get those internal audit teams involved, get the risk teams involved um, and make sure that they can bring those processes along because there's a little bit more to, to complying with those um, directives and those standards than just getting the right data points out at the other end. Um, and I think that's going to be the thing that companies should really start focusing on early. Thank you both for sharing your regulatory wrap up with our listeners every year, whether it's just a text or phone you as a friend, or we have you in front of our executive team. I'm so thankful for the wisdom you bring around the globe as how we tackle ESG regulation. One of the things that we love to do is wave our magic uh, Harry Potter wands. And so we'll definitely put some resources in the show notes for all of our listeners. Steve is a host of a sister podcast, Off the Books. Andy has done some remarkable blogs that simplify this for each of you in our audience. We look forward to helping you navigate regulations with different perspectives in the new year. Thanks, everyone. And we'll talk real soon. <laughs>